Yo, what's going on, GBA fans? I'm Ben. I'm joined by my usual co-host. Introduce yourself. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Melantosh here after my week break. And we are here to bring you all the power rankings for week six of GBA Season 9. So, let's just hop right in with both of our number 16s of, big surprise, Deathly. Once again, he doesn't upload his side, so we have no earthly idea why he clicked Shadow Ball against the Vaporeon with his Goth Tail. Uh, when I was watching Goldo's side, I was just like, he has the Vaporeon trapped in here. If he just clicks Energy Ball and he can kill it, his Nihiligo can win the game, assuming it is indeed Scarf, but he, he clicked Shadow Ball for some obscure reason unbeknownst to me. Yeah, fair enough. I don't have any notes for Deathly. It's a sec it's a second week in a row he didn't upload, so um, yeah, I, I I don't have any notes for him. Um, he lost again. Uh, I think he needs to make transactions. Yeah, for real. <laughs> and that's and that's that. I think um, he even I mean he 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 has in my opinion the worst team in the league, so he's already at a disadvantage going in, um, and he needs to try and solve it out. But other than that, should we just move on? Uh, I do have a couple other notes here. Okay, uh, you, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so about that Shadow Ball play, if he was predicting the Victini to switch in, then he's even worse than we all thought because, you know, Shadow Tag literally had Goldilla stuck in there with his Vaporeon. But otherwise, I don't think he made any super weird plays. I I will say that he's been using his Nihiligo somewhat decently, so I think that's a mon he should start bringing literally every week if he wants to have a shot at winning a game. But, uh... Uh, yeah, since he hasn't uploaded it yet, like we said, there's not much else we can really say about him, I don't think. Yeah, Nihiligo is also like his second fastest Mon or something like that. Something like Behind that. Behind Verizion, yeah. so it kind of does have to come every game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's move. Are you, are you done now? Yeah, yeah. We can move on. Um, so now we're on to 15. Again, not much to say. Carl, I believe it was Carl that didn't have the time to play this week and not Envy. Yeah. Um, so, don't really have much to say at all, to be honest. Um, yeah, it, it happens, life happens. Um, hopefully he can play next week. Yeah. Kyle hasn't really been playing great, but at least he knows the basics of the game, unlike a certain coach we have below him. <coughs> but yeah, um, how are we good to move on? Oh, man. <laughs> okay, uh, so we take your number 14, uh, and sure my thing. number 11. Ooh, quite a big jump there. Um, and Nate, why didn't you crack on Nate as you have him lower? Okie doke. So I think Nate just kind of got outplayed this game, but I think that was mostly because he played too passively. I saw that he had a handful of opportunities to gain momentum, but he always just made the safe play, and Tup took full advantage of that. One play in particular that caught my attention was when Tup sent in the Diggersby on the Sylveon. I don't know why Nate didn't click Protect. If he had done that, he could have scouted to see what move Tup locked into because he had already seen that was a Scarf Diggers as they outsped the Mewtwo earlier in the game. So if he locks himself into a normal ground move, okay, cool, free Skarmory. If he locks himself into a fire move or U-turn, then cool, you stay in, you can click Wish, you get more health back. At first, I didn't really think it was a game-changing misplay because, you know, Nate went into a Skarmory on the U-turn, it didn't really take much damage, the Diggers took more damage than he did, but Tup gained that momentum. And if Nate had just protected and seen that, uh, he could have just, again, clicked a, f a move for free, either like Hyper Voice or Wish, since I don't really expect the Tup would go f straight into Scissor after seeing that um, he had the HP Fire. Uh, but yeah, that would keep the Sylveon healthy, and I don't think it dies to that Melodic there in the late game. So Sylveon being around keeps the rest of the team healthy, and while it's hard to say exactly how the game would have played out, I think he would have been in a much, much better position. Uh, but yeah, that's just one example of how I feel he played kind of passively. Yeah, I, 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 I know what you mean, and I feel like, to be honest with you, um, Sylveon plus Skarm could have won this game. Yeah, Top, absolutely. Like, and, and one other big issue I had with Nate was that he pretty much he left the Skarmory in versus Latias, which could have had T-Bolt and done a lot. It did, but Top made a prediction. He also left it in plus Milotic, um, but it was like Skarm was so important in this game. He didn't have a good Diggersby switch in or Sizzle switch in outside of Skarm. So I'm not really sure why he left it in in those scenarios. Um, it, it, it seemed to me like um, he just didn't analyze properly um, how valuable Skarmory and, like you said, the, Sil the Sylveon were this game for him. Um, and uh, yeah, there were a few, a few weird things this game. I'm sure you'll agree, but he kind of just ended up subbing and just giving his um, Naga... We're just going to, I don't even Pokemon. know. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the Milotic, which was just able to stall it out because it did get burned. 
Um, so that, that just seemed very strange to me that after the first sub, he, he he didn't make a different play as he ended up just letting his 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 purple stingy bee thing um, <laughs> get weakened down and then just went back into the Sylveon, which is, I don't know, I just found that series of plays very um, unoptimal. That's your favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and he had Toad to switch into Milotic as well. He could have gone for a, gone for a Stool War, um, especially when he didn't switch. He stayed in with Skarmory when Toad could have switched in and it was much less valuable um, than Skarm. If he had had Skarm at the end instead of Toad, it would have well, it would have been a long stall war between Skarm and Sizzle, let's just say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I don't know if Top has Swords Dance or not. I don't think he did. I don't think he did either. I think he was Superpower, U-Turn, Bullet Punch, Roost, I think. Yeah. So I think I, I think Skarm wins that war. Maybe not, but I don't know. Um, I liked he brought Whirlwind Skarm. He's listening. He's learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those are the issues this game. I feel like a lot of Nate's games are, are, I think partly because his team's so good, is are his to win, um, and he makes a few errors that lose him the games, I think. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Uh, and I guess I will say, though, that playing passively isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I don't think Nate played too horribly, but I just feel like he's not quite on the same level of some of the guys that we have above him. Agreed, yep. But I think he's got potential, and I think he can bounce back. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think a, a big way that would help him bounce back is I don't feel he's been using Mewtwo to its uh, full potential. Like this week, he let it take loads of damage from Scarf Diggers B right off the bat. Um, and if Top had just, you know, fired off a return or something, that maybe could have killed. Um, so I feel like he could utilize Mewtwo a bit better. It, it, it doesn't seem to be putting in as much work as a lot of the other Ubers are. Um, and it's got a great speed stat and great move pull. So I. Uh, I, I, I think he needs to use it slightly more carefully. Yeah, that's true. Um, in fact, I can't recall off the top of my head, have there been any times when he's brought, like, Calm Mind Recover to attacks? I think he brought it against Tom. Or something similar. I think he's brought it twice, I think. Okay. Because, yeah, that just feels like the best set to me. It feels like a, yeah. a Latios on steroids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, you couldn't have said it any better. Like, um, Mewtwo is actually really bulky. Like, it's surprisingly bulky. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, I do hope he brings that set more. But, yeah, I think we've talked about Nate enough. Uh, so, if you've yeah, got nothing else too. to say, we can move on. Yeah, yeah, let's move on. So, we take my number 14 and your... Number 13. Number 13 in Nexus. Uh, okay, I'll take Nexus. Um... I, I mean, ugh, I think, for like I say the same thing every week. Well, obviously, when I'm not here, I don't say it. But <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, about Nexus is that he he loses in prep most games. Um, although this game, he he lost in prep, but also I felt he got outplayed. But it's like he lost in prep before he got outplayed, anyways. But he doesn't make any huge misplays, unlike um, which is why I have him above uh, Carl and Deathly for me is he's not making misplays and he's, he's playing well it's just the builds I thought that he could improve on uh, however this game he could have gone Celestina on the Azelf explosion because he did notice turn one that he did feel like it was a lead Azelf which really often carry explosion the Celestina for me was the um, the, the, the obvious play um, I think um, other than that like I said um, he, uh, he he made a solid prediction with the EQ player it was quite obvious but um yeah, like, it's solid play. He seemed a bit rushed, but other than that, he's solid. I have him below people like uh, Danzer and Tom. I just feel like they've been a bit more consistent than Nexus. Um, so, yeah, that's why I've got Nexus where I've got him. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of what you just said. And to add on to that, I feel like the reason he lost was because, while his performance wasn't bad, Aaron's performance was stellar. And Agreed. Yeah, I wouldn't say he played right into Aaron's hands since the game was still somewhat close, but... Nexus basically did everything that Aaron expected him to, and yeah, it was mostly just Aaron playing really, really well. Agreed, and we'll get onto this when we get to Aaron, but um, I really feel like even though it was 1-0, Aaron, and, and even though Aaron went down, it felt like he had control Yeah. for the whole match, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, is that you finished with Nexus? Yeah, I guess that's basically all there is to say. Okay, cool. So, should we move on to Tom? 
sure thing. Do you, another non-upload. Do you have notes on Tom? Uh, yeah, I have a few notes on Tom. Okay, so, cool. firstly, where was the Mega Lucario? Yeah, that's in my notes as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but since he hasn't uploaded, of course, um, we can't really say too much about his sets, or like maybe he has some reason as to why he didn't bring Mega Lucario, but uh, I would be interested in seeing what the Weavile set was to see if he had Ice Shard or not, because not bringing that would feel a bit strange on a banded set, if he was indeed banded, which I didn't actually run the calc, so maybe I should have done that. Oops. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to trust what Randy said in his commentary that he thinks he was banded. But, yeah, um, I, th I thought he was banded as well, but I also did not do the calcs, so... <laughs> we, are, we are really good at this. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, but uh, clicking knockoff with his banded Weavile against the Megalodias, I feel, was a misplay. Because Randy... Again, we're assuming that Randy knows he was banded. So he could have just gone into his... Randy could have just gone into his Clefable, Fable, removed the Choice Scarf, bada-bing, bada-boom, it can click moves freely again. And then I think he misplayed again in front of the Clefable with his Coco. Uh, he clicked Thunderbolt the first time, and that made sense. Uh, he wanted to punish the switch, but I don't get why he didn't click Roost after that. Because I'm pretty sure he had Roost on that side. I think that was revealed already. Uh, so, yeah, he knew that Clef was locked and it was Clef was locked into Stealth Rock. And while Roost wouldn't appeal to love a ton since he was at like 70% or so, any health he can recover is important. And after that, Randy sent in his Scarf and Fernape. Tom could have stayed in with his Coco if it was at full, but he was forced to switch out into Glyscore, which got burned by the Flare Blitz, and everything just kind of went downhill from there. Yeah, he could have U-turned as well. Either Roost or U-turn. Um, yeah. Did he have U-turn? Um, I think he did. Yeah, he did, he did. I, I remember him clicking in front of this weekend. So, uh, I agree with you that I think Roost is better than U-turn, but I think definitely Roost or U-turn. Um, also... Um, he was a bit unfortunate with the with the burn from the Gliscor. That 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 must have really sucked. <laughs> yeah. Um, to be honest with him, uh, uh, with you, sorry. And I really like I helped Randy uh, not a lot, but a tiny bit with prep. And like he, I I really felt Araquanid and and definitely Lucario, like you said, had really good matchups. Um, this game, um, especially like. I mean, Lucario is just a better bullet puncher than Sizzle, I think. <laughs> yeah, Lucario <laughs> like it's just bit... is just absurd. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 such a great mon. So, um, and obviously, we we maybe Tom had reasoning that we're not seeing, but we haven't seen his team builder. So, from our perspective, it definitely seems like Lucario should have come this game. Um, and I still feel like uh, Raquinid could have been really good for him this game. So, yeah. Exactly. But other than that, that's all I have to say for Tom. All right. So I guess now we can move on to a number of a person. Uh, my number 13, your number 11 in Danza. Sure. Which is another, you guys are getting the theme this week, aren't you? <laughs> another <laughs> full game, which, which wasn't completely uploaded, but he did make some nice little pictures for us to look at. So that was nice of him. Yeah, so it's of course a shame that uh, they that Danza and Astro got disconnected like at the very end of their insanely long game. Uh, but shout outs to Danza for at least for, for finding a way to get his video up and to show us what happened in the game. So, uh, other things we can really say about Danza, I mean, he finally picked up that Crocodile, it's been sitting there since like week two, so his team's actually looking decent now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but yeah, because we didn't see the actual game, we can't really say a ton about either of these guys, but it seemed to me no. that both of them played amazingly. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, and I mean, Danza seemed to think he played really well, <laughs> so I, I, I went ahead and trust him on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> take his word for it. Yeah, let's just take his word for it. Um, also, I've been in two Wi-Fi leagues with Danza, and he's gone to timer two times in each league, so that's one down. If the statistics are true, he's going to have one more this season, and then we're done. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah. That's that's it. Should we move on then? Yeah, sure thing. Um, taking whoa, that's a big jump. Both our number tens in Goldoa. I guess so. Yeah, we've covered everyone below them. Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, okay, so Goldoa. Let me get my notes up for Goldoa. Okay. Um, okay, so obviously Goldoa was playing Deathly, which is why I didn't move him up too much this week. Um, and I felt that Goldoa played a pretty solid match but i felt it started to get a bit shaky um at the end game um because he had his dialga in and deathly brought in the kiram 
<clears throat> and he had his Vaporeon in the back, but he didn't want... Um, basically, he thought if he went Vape, then Deathly would go Goth and be able to set up because he was really scared of Trick Carmine. And then he'd be able to trick back the Scarf and outspeed everything. But if you have uh, a full health Teeny and a full health Dialga, like, Gothitelle is not going to be able to um, really beat that at all, especially when you have Raw on Vaporeon. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really and 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 then Nihilego started becoming a real big problem because the Dialga went down and didn't have enough health to deal with it. When a healthy Dialga always beats Nihilego, 100 percent of the time. So I really felt like he shouldn't have taken the damage versus the Kieran White um, with his Dialga at the very end. That was my uh, big issue because it, it, the Nihilego was starting to look pretty dangerous at the end. Um, so yeah, that's. That's all I've really got to say. He played a solid game, though. Yeah. Uh, that Vaporeon Dialga, like, had he been able to keep her on that Dialga, to keep a little bit more health on that Dialga, yeah, and he could have, like, maybe wished it up a bit more with his Vaporeon yep. in the late game, that could have really been a problem for Deathly. But uh, otherwise, yeah, I think he played solidly. But to be fair, uh, like you already mentioned, he was playing both of our number 16, so winning shouldn't have been too much of a challenge. <laughs> uh, but he did do a good job of preserving the Dialga as late as he did. Uh, because, like, when Deathly sent out his Duraptor earlier, and he was presumably locked into Double Edge, at first I was thinking that Goldoa should go into the Dialga, since, you know, it resists. But at the moment, I wasn't thinking about the late game. Fortunately, Goldoa was. He knew that he needed <laughs> to keep it healthy for, like, Volcarona, Kiram White, and Heligo, uh, and he was able to kill two of those with that. And Vaporeon, I think, was a great bring. I think he played it perfectly. I would, I probably would have protected there at the end against the Nihiligo on that last turn, just for the extra leftover recovery and extra burn damage. But it really wasn't a big deal at all. It would have made no difference in the end. Just an observation. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, I'm glad to see Galois win another game, and I hope he can. Well, I I'm hoping he can win out the rest of the season. But looking at the schedule, I don't have much faith. No. Well, Galois, he seems to get progressively better as the season goes on. So you never know. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to both of our number nines yep. in Necro. Uh, do you want to take Necro? Sure. Necro, it may be two and four, but he just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jolt this week, and he almost won. In terms of misplays, I think his only real mistake was sacking his Charizard to the Manaphy. After roosting, he could have gone into Xerneas, uh, lived the plus, the plus three Surf, and I believe Moonblast would have chipped it down into Mianchez's high jump kick range. I could be mistaken. Uh, but then if that was the case at that point, Jolt's last mod is Magirna, Necro still had a healthy Zardex in the back, and he could have won there. I suppose Jolt could have gone into Magirna on the Moonblast to preserve his Zardex check, uh, but unless Jolt pulls an aggressive double back and a Manaphy on the Charizard switch, I think Necro would have won that game. Regardless, I think he played, he, I think I really do think he played a great game, and that 2-4 record is not a reflection on his play this season. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think he really needs to keep his head up after this week and just keep plugging along because the way he's been playing, he is going to start getting wins again. Um, he got very unlucky against Nate. Um, and this week he went up against a very tough jolt. Um, but Necro was awesome this game. The pain split on the Fortress was really clean prep. Um, the Thunder miss was unfortunate, but at the end of the day, like it's Thunder. If you bring Thunder... You can't be mad if it misses. That's that you, you know. You know going into the game, you've got one game to do it, so you've got to know that that's a risk you're willing to take. Um, and if it doesn't come off, then the, the, then it doesn't come off. Um, and then basically, like you said with the Zard, uh, he maybe could have saved it. But other than that, he he like you said went toe to toe to one of the best coaches in the league. Um, spoilers, but uh, he's both of our number five, so that is definitely. Um, Definitely shows why Necro is, uh, is is so high on our list. He's one of the highest four and twos. Two and fours. Uh, two and fours. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. So keep your head up, dude. Keep fighting. Um, have you got anything else to say? Uh, no, I think we've covered Necro. So now we can move on to both of our number eights of Tup. Okay. Um, so Tup. Okay. First of all, with Tup, I really think he should drop Greninja. Um, because he can pick up a tier 1. Greninja is not doing super well. Um, he's only got Battle Bond off once, which is when it becomes the real threat. Um, it, it, it's not a real threat 
uh, just as regular Greninja. Don't forget, re regular Greninja is a great mon, but it's not a tier two. He I mean, Greninja is his tier one. <laughs> so, essentially, yeah. It's essentially, so I know I'd... And he's basically using regular Gren at the moment. Yeah. Basically what he's using right now, like you said, uh, he's only gotten to Ash Greninja once, so he's essentially using a standard Torrent Greninja without Torrent. So it's like... Yeah, it's even worse, technically, yeah. Technically, yeah. Um, yeah, there are loads of great uh, Ubers that he could pick from, and I think he definitely needs to make a change. Um, but uh, do you want to talk for a bit on his play, and then I'll go afterwards? Uh, sure uh -huh. thing. He did get a bit lucky with some Skull Burns at good times, but I feel like he really did just outplay Nate this game. As we mentioned before, Nate played kind of passively, Tup took full advantage of that. He made some nice reads like fire punching the Skarmory on the switch in, dragon tailing the incoming Seismitoad with the Melodic. Uh, but I think the only real misplay he made was not calm minding with Eladios in front of the Tornadus. Uh, he did acknowledge that in his commentary, but otherwise I don't think there was much else he did wrong. Uh, I have a couple things that I think he could have done slightly better. He, I'm not sure why he stayed in with his Zero Aura when he had loads and loads of great Seismitoad checks. I mean, I don't feel like Seismitoad, uh, um, Milotic ever gets beaten by Seismitoad or really Latte either. So I, I feel like, and Zero was, was quite a big threat to Nate this game because of its speed tier, um, and the nature of, of Nate's team. So I felt like staying in there, even though... Without the Rindo, it probably would have killed, right? Um, I don't think Rindo... it would have killed without the Rindo. Oh, 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 really? Then, yeah, he definitely should not have stayed in. Um, and Rindo's always a possibility on Seismitoad. Yeah, yeah. So. In fact, I was thinking Nate should have clicked. I, I believe he had Toxic on that set. Um, if he did, I think he should have clicked that there. But, I mean, the Earthquake play was... worked. So. Yeah, and, and, and I think Top had already got the Flame of off on his Milotic. Oh, had he? Yeah, then, wow. That would have been an easy switch, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I, I just don't know why, yeah. I, if he didn't and I'm wrong, then I get why he stayed in. But I, I think that Milotic already had the burn um, from Flame Orb, so. Um, also, he, uh, like, like like I was talking about with Greninja, he made a very, very ballsy play as switching a, a Dark-type Greninja straight into a Sylveon, um, which ended up working out for him. Um, but it, it, it didn't really make sense in the long run because Gren just goes down, it gets a gunk shot off, but it doesn't like kill the Sylveon or anything. Um, and he kind of just feel, I feel like he wastes Gren um, this match, to be honest with you. Um, and what I, I, I don't like that he sacked Milotic versus the Mewtwo because Mewtwo is either going for Energy Ball, Thunderbolt or Psychic in that situation versus the Milotic. And what resists all of those? Mega Scizor. Um, and it's probably in range of Bullet Punch from Mega Scizor. So I really feel like Milotic basically won the game as well. Um, he ended up winning anyway, so it didn't matter. But I really feel uh, he should not have sacked the Milotic versus the Mewtwo. Yeah. Um, but other than that, Tup played really, really solidly, to be honest. Yeah. To be fair, he did get crit by the Energy Ball. But had he just switched out, that wouldn't have been a problem. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, right. Anything else to say right, about yeah. Tup? No, no, he played really well. He out prep, he outplayed Nate this game, so he right. played well. So I guess now we can move on to the big seven. Yeah, definitely the big seven for sure. All right, which um, one should we do? Let's first? go for your number seven. Okay, Derek. And my number four in Randy. I'll let you take Randy because that's quite low for a five and one team. Yeah. So, like I've mentioned in past weeks, the big seven are all really good. I'm just going to start referring to them as the big seven, kind of like a yeah, yeah. 2016 reference, but yeah. seven instead of six. Yeah, so uh, the big seven. I've got Randy at the bottom, uh, but I mean, he is part of the big seven. He's good. Randy found himself in a bit of a tough spot after the Mega Latias got paralyzed by Coco's Thunderbolt. Clef was tricked to Scarf, but then he essentially 1v1 to Tapu Coco with his Suicune. I do think he misplayed a little bit around the Latios. Vincun is an amazing set. It can stall out, like, almost everything if played well. But Calm Mind Latios is a very, very good response to it. Psyshock, of course, ignores these Spadef boosts, so it can just Calm Mind up right alongside it and just start clicking buttons. So once the Calm Mind Latios was revealed, I think Randy should have just gone straight into his Evil tool. Uh, but, I mean, he still did deal with it in a different way. Once the Suicune chipped it down into Infernape range, he went into his Eveltal, because if Tom went on the offensive and killed the Eveltal on the switch, cool, Randy Revengeance with Infernape. 
if Tom goes for the recover, which is what Randy was predicting, then Evelthal should be able to put it in range of Infernape regardless. And I guess one last nitpick that I have is that he had to rely on a Rock Slide Flinch to win in the game there at the end. He needed a little extra chip on the Scizor, and I think in order to do that, he would have to make some aggressive plays. Uh, sending in the Metagross is fine, but I think he should have doubled out into Infernape. Tom had to keep the Scizor healthy, so Randy could U-turn out on the Latios switch, kill that, then he could just clean up with Scarf Flare Blitz afterwards. Uh, but instead, he tried to set up with the Metagross, and he won due to getting a bit of luck with that flinch. Yeah, uh, agreed. I think Randy still had a small chance to win without the flinch, because... Uh, and he had Infernape and Yuvelto left, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what he had left. I think you're right. And, right. and Tom would have had Scizor, Weavile, Latte, and a Burnt Glisco. And I'm looking at that, and uh, Yuvelto beats everything except Weavile, which Ape deals with pretty well. Yeah, it's a matter of how he would be able to play around those, because exactly. just, and just having that Infernape doesn't mean that no, he's going to be able to Yeah, yeah. Yeah, agreed. And it depends how depends on how Tom uh, played it as well. If Tom played it correctly, he probably still would have won. Exactly. Um, but he still had a chance without the flinch. Um, Randy did. Um, so yeah, I have Randy this low because I feel he's been kind of getting a bit lucky this season with a lot of his wins. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. But he's still like a solid player. He's got an amazing team. And yeah, he's still a threat. Yeah, agreed. Um, going back to your um, Kuhn versus Latios. Well, sorry, Shuikun versus Latios. Um, I, I felt like he he was saying in his in his commentary as he was setting up with the Suicune that oh yeah this beats me, but then he just kept instead of playing around it, he just kept setting up. Um, whereas I feel like if he wanted the damage for Ape, maybe he should have gone for the damage, or as soon as Latios went for Calm Mind, he should have gone Yuvelto. Um, mm -hmm. I don't feel like Tom stays in there because if Sucker Punch always kills a Latios, and the only way that Tom would kill is with a Z move. So the Sucker Punch would just, even if he goes to the Z move, is would would, would kill the Latios. Um, and Yvolto's Sucker Punch is nothing to uh, sniff at. So I feel like he should have just gone straight straight into the Yvolto, the monster, um, there instead of setting up with Kuhn, pretty much like you said. Um, but however, he did keep a clear game plan in mind there we go i've nailed it, I've nailed it. <laughs> um with, with his metagross which i like i always like to see that in coaches it's something i always look for um and rounded that really well this game um and i think the reason i'm a bit higher than you is although like you said he has been getting lucky he's still five at one in the end of the day um so yeah 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 for sure cool that's all i have to say about randy okie doke so now we can move on to your number seven and my number four of Envy. Envy is so good at this game that he won by doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> but yeah, like we talked about earlier, uh, real life happens. Kyle had to forfeit uh, due to being too busy with real life stuff. Uh, but in all fairness, I think the forfeit, all it really changed was differential because I'm pretty confident when I say that Envy would have won this game just based on how his and Kyle seasons have been going thus far. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you, to be honest. He <laughs> he probably would have won the game, but um, the reason I didn't really move him up or down is, yes, he got the win, but it was a forfeit win. So I felt like I'd rather put people who played their games, even though it's not his fault, um, and I, I, feel, I feel like you've earned it a bit more if you if you win the game. However, if he wins next week, uh, there's a good chance that I'll have him more similarly placed to you. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so let's move on. Sure. To both of our number sixes and Aster which I believe is the last non-upload. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I believe there were five games that didn't get uploaded this week. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, but Aster is the last one we haven't covered. Uh, again, he didn't upload, so there's not a ton we can say about him. No. Uh, Based on According what... to Danza, he just got outplayed. <laughs> <laughs> According to Danza. Uh, according to King Danza, who is the greatest human being to ever walk the earth. Uh, that's that's what he says anyway. Uh, based on Danza's lovely animations, I think we can safely say that this was a fantastic performance from both ends. Uh, and I've only got Astro this low because I don't know where else I'm supposed to put him. Yeah, all the other coaches above him have just been doing so well. Yeah. Um, and when And when... It's hard for us to tell if 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 we watch the game and he obviously played outstandingly well, I might have him above 
Joel or Randy, but we haven't, so we can't tell. Yeah, it's also not his fault, so kind of yeah, don't want to put him too low to. Well, make that, him like yeah, that's hard. exactly how I feel. Yeah. yeah. Um, so should we go on to both of our number fives in nice. Jolt? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'll i be honest. I couldn't find much to say about this game. Jolt's yeah, prep and play was <laughs> solid as always. <laughs> yeah. It's literally exactly the same. I have like three bullet points and one of them is Jolt played amazingly. Like, <laughs> What, what um, even is there to say about Jolt anymore that nobody, that everybody doesn't already know? How does England no, work? His, his, his prep is just unreal. It, it, I, it's, he's one of the best preppers out there the ground on set was perfect um his team is so versatile it can be bulky it can be hyper offense um yeah i'm well done it was such a good game and i feel like um necro played above a number nine slot that he's at absolutely yeah so i feel like jolt should be equally rewarded for how for the for the person he was playing not just their ranking um and necro played really well this game so it was a really good win for Jolt. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that Jolt is sitting at four and two now. So if he had lost that, he would be sitting at three three, and he might not actually make playoffs depending on how things play out. So yeah, that was a good win. Yeah. Well, it's Jolt. I'd always still back him to make playoffs. Yeah, but, yeah of course. But uh, yeah. Just how just how the competition has been this season. Yeah, it's been really high. Um, so should we move on to your number three and my number two in Lars? Sure. Well, well, well. Lars finally loses the game. Yeah. So the first thing that caught my eye. At first, I was stunned that the Ferrothor not sped the Azumarill. I thought Leo had some sort of amazing prep by speed creeping it despite having Gyro Ball, thereby forcing it out after the belly drum. Then after like 10 minutes of staring at it, I finally realized <laughs> Trick Room was up. <laughs> so yeah, I... I guess that's just a misplay on Lars's end, trying to set up with his Azumarill in front of the Ferrothorn with the Trick Room still up, to the point where he would get two code by the Power Whip. Yeah, I think he just felt a bit rushed into it because he wanted to set up on the Cresselia, and he went for the Memento, and then Leo went into the Ferrothorn on the Memento, and Lars just sort of went for it anyway, I think. Yeah. He did have another chance to set up later in the game, thanks to his healing wish Jirachi. The terrifying Death Rabbit came in on the Cresselia, but without its Citrus Berry, it wasn't able to take the 50% from Belly Drum, plus the uh, chip from Cresselia and Smart Shadow Shadow Sneak. So yeah, like you said, it just felt like Lars was trying too hard to make his Azumarill sweep when Leo had too many healthy checks in the back that could just very easily cripple it. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I feel like Lars wasn't. I feel like Lars wasn't really at his best this week. But to be fair, he was playing Leo, who's had an amazing season. And when two amazing players face each other, some, someone's got to lose. So. Agreed. And he did mention in his commentary that he was not building to his full because he thought there was a very high chance he was going to play Leo in playoffs. Um, so I think that played a bit of part in it. Um, but he had a very, very aggressive game plan <laughs> and a mindset this game. Um, and I just think that. It didn't quite fall his way because looking at Leo's um, uh, commentary, um, you see that uh, when <laughs> Leo went into the Ferrothorn, not because he predicted the Memento and then it would stop Lars from being able to belly drum with his Azumarill, because if Lars gets in with Azumarill against the Cresselia that turn, uh, it, I think this game changes. <laughs> yeah. Like, because like, he has the Healing Wish so he can get the Azumarill back and get the Paralysis that I'm assuming Leo would have gone for. Um, off the Azumarill so r really I, I felt like it, not that it was lucky because it was a good play from Leo but I just feel like the, the things didn't fall Lars's way this game and I think he didn't adapt well when they didn't start falling his way like he shouldn't have gone Azumarill on the Ferrothorn um, yeah there's a good chance he doesn't have power whip but if he does um, you almost lost the match from there so I felt that he just rushed setting up too much um but other than that, yeah, like you said, two really good players going at it. Um, it was a fun game to watch, and I'm sure Lars will bounce back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so cool. Should we move on to my number three and your number one, sure actually? Thing. And that's Aaron. Aaron. So Aaron continues his amazing season. Uh, he finally brought more than just the seven bonds he's been bringing, so that's pretty neat. Yay! <laughs> Still no Shiny Rayquaza, but... No, you know, I was just about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> one day, one day. <laughs> Maybe someday. But uh, yeah, so he got up his rocks. 
He made some aggressive double to keep up the momentum, and most importantly, he identified his win condition early. He knew Rayquaza could win in the late game, so he made sure to keep it healthy and to chip down the things he needed to in order to make that happen. Uh, Aaron plays safely, but beautifully, because he has a clear game mind in plan, and yes, I just said that on purpose. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the reason I have I, Aaron below Lars and Leo is that, like you said, he's been playing really, really well. I love he's been this is the I think the biggest change from last season is he's had a win con. Um, it's pretty much always Rayquaza, <laughs> but 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 he has a win con every week and he he doesn't risk the win con unnecessarily. Like this week um, when Nexus was trying to predict him to go into the Rayquaza on the, when he was in with Boswell versus Aegislash uh, and he predicted him and went for the Ice Punch and Aaron was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to risk. Uh, literally the thing I have to win the game, um, which is definitely how, how you want to play. Um, and he started reading Nexus well as he pulled a double out into Mamo um, as Nexus went out into the Rotom. But he did a calc wrong or something because he said he was guaranteed to kill the Rotom. This was before he made the double. Uh, guaranteed to kill the Rotom um, with Stone Edge from Mamo, and it didn't kill, and it ended up crippling uh, the Mamo, meaning that he lost his absolute best Zygarde check, um, which is obviously one of the biggest threats on on uh, Nexus's team. So in that regard, I felt he shouldn't have risked the Mamo because there, if, if he calped max defensive or very defensive Rotom, he would have seen that uh, Mamo doesn't always kill there with the Stone Edge. Plus, he could have missed. So I don't feel like that was the play with Mamo. If he had missed, then Zygarde may have won Pot the game. Potentially. Potentially, if, 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 if the Mamo had gone down and he wouldn't have been in a good position if it missed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but he's 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 winning. He's playing really really well this season. Um, those are just nitpicks. Like he's still my number three. Um, I really liked his low punny play with the Zygarde. I know it se kind of seems like he just sacked low punny, um, but it, he either kills the Zygarde or forces um, the outrage, which means that he can beat the Zygarde, which is such a big threat since Mamo had gone down. Um, yeah, he played really well this game. Cool, so let's move on to both of our number one, no, no, sorry, my number one and your number two. Yep. In Leo. Um, so this is a bit like Jolt, I don't have that much to say about Leo. I think he played really well, he prepped really well, Marshadow is unreal. <laughs> like, it's just <laughs> such a great mon. Um, the Ferrothorn play versus Azu, I, I, like I said, didn't predict it, but it was still such a clean play and it covered. Even though he, he didn't see it coming, it covered the memento into Belly Drum Azumarill. Um, but the reason I don't feel as much to say is I do feel like, like I said with Lars, I feel like this game kind of just fell his way. It wasn't hacks, it just kind of went in his direction um, and he didn't have to do much to win the game. Um, Lars kind of gave him the game because of his game plan and how it didn't, it didn't quite go to plan. So yeah, he played super well. He beat the number one and I think he's the number one ranked team in the league right now. So, congrats, keep it up. Yeah, he made a couple of very minor misplays, but otherwise he just had full control of this game. Uh, when Lars tried to do everything he could to get the Azumarill to sweep, Leo's Ferrothorn and Cresselia just kind of sat there and said, nah. Uh, the Marshadow and the Darkrai were just kind of like, nice undefeated record you have there, Lars. It would be a shame if someone smashed it. And then they smashed it. But yeah, Leo really just had full control of this game. Uh, okay, so that that's our last person, right? That pretty much wraps things up. Yeah. Um, cool. So thank you guys for watching. I uh, hope you checked out all the matches from this week, even though it was a little bit limited compared to normal weeks. But make sure you check out all the coaches in the comment section, not the comment the section. Every time, every time <laughs> in the description down below. They all make great content um, for you guys every week. But other than that, Ben, do you have anything else to add? It's thunderstorming outside, and I'm really hoping that I didn't get any of that on my audio in the recording in the, the thing and loud and noise. Cool. We'll see you guys next week.